Good morning, church. We're so glad you joined us this morning. So glad you came to worship with us. I just want to encourage you right now to open up your heart and worship and sing along. Uh, my good friend Marco, who recently joined our worship team and who actually I've known my whole life. I've, I've known him ever since he was little. We grew up in the same church. He's going to lead us into worship this morning, along with Blake, who's been around for a couple of months helping us out. Uh, and let's just open up our hearts and, and let's just um, sing every word. Let's just mean every word that we're singing. Let's just offer our worship to God. And at the same time, let's prepare our hearts to hear the message that Pastor Ken has prepared for us this morning. Let's be receptive, let's be open, and let God speak to us. And I will see you right after the message. Let's engage together. Good morning, church. We're going to worship together this morning. neighbors our blood is one children of generations of every nation of kingdom come so don't let your heart be troubled hold your head up high don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you So take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where hell comes from Swing wide, all you have is Let the praise go 
lost the best of good Will you never die for me? There is another in your fire
not the joy of everybody Cause I know that's where you'll be Dear God, we thank you so much for today, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness and kindness, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are always with us, God, that you are always in our fire, God. You are always in the midst, Lord. We just pray that you would surround us, that we would always be feeling your spirit, God, that we would be always turning towards you, God, when we are uh, in the shadow, God. I pray that we would be always... Um, shining your light, God, to everybody around us, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for the message that we're going to hear. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and that we would be open to hear and listen and just live by your word. Amen. Kids, I am coming to you from home today as my cameraman, Pastor David, took a much deserved vacation this week. So I'm here on my own recording today. I'm in my comfy clothes and I'm ready to go. So last week, we continued on in our Easter series. Easter Sunday has passed already, but in our lesson, we talked about what happened after Jesus died and rose from the dead. After Jesus rose from the dead, for the next 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples and many other people and showed them that he was alive and well. He taught the disciples about how what he did on the cross was what God had told everyone that he would do, and that it was the only way for people to be forgiven and to be with God forever. The disciples understood what he was saying, and Jesus told the disciples that he had to go back to heaven. But after he left, he would send the Holy Spirit, just as God had promised, to be their helper. Jesus told the disciples to go and tell the whole world about him and of the good news of forgiveness. After the 40 days were up, Jesus rose up to heaven on a cloud, and not long after, the Holy Spirit came to be with the disciples, just as Jesus said, this week in your weekly challenge, I asked you to send me a response answering the question of how the Holy Spirit helps us. Here are your responses. Um, when Jesus goes back to heaven, he sent us the Holy Spirit to us. Who sent what to be our helper? The Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit helps um, us do the things we can't do. Okay. The Holy Spirit is something that Jesus set down after his death and went to heaven again. The Holy Spirit. Is, uh, the Holy Spirit is something to guide us when we are stuck and we don't know what to do. It shows us what to do when we aren't confused about something. The Holy Spirit guides us when we're confused and need help. The Holy Spirit gives us power when we're weak. And last week, we had a number of powerhouse kids reach a new prize milestone. Congrats to Kai, Israel, Audrey, Zion, Nico, and Luca on completing your weekly challenges. Let's see your prizes.
Hello everyone and welcome. If you are joining us for the first time, we are happy you found us and we would love to connect with you. Please click on the button below, I'm new here, and we would love to contact you and give you a free gift. Now thank you to everyone who gives so generously. You can go to our website to see the different ways in which you can give. Starting Sunday, May 8th, we'll be hosting small groups again on Zoom. Details will follow for the topics and the leaders of these small groups. Please check out our ministries online and see what's available for you. Now let's hear today's message from Pastor Ken Miles. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad that you joined us today. Well, we are continuing on our series on all things new. And for the last number of weeks, we've been talking about the new things that God is doing. Verse we're using every week is Isaiah 43 and verse 19. It says, for I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? Now, this is our problem. We don't see what the Lord is doing. And as a result, we get frustrated or just... Uh, a point disappointed, and we get to a state of, of even despair sometimes because we don't see the new thing that God is doing. And so I wanted to just zero in on this a little bit this morning and see what do we see? How do we see things? And so I want to talk to you about a new perspective, a new perspective. Now, if you look in the dictionary, what uh, perspective says, it says, a point of view, the angle you see something from, your perspective. So if I'm looking at this table from over here, I have this perspective. If I'm looking from this side, I have this perspective. And so I see things differently. So a perspective is a point of view. And the angle you see something at. Uh, it, there can be a literal point of view, as I've just mentioned. Physically seeing something and having a point of view. But it also is a mental point of view. And really, this is where we really need to focus. And realize that the way you see things is from a certain perspective. If you didn't have that perspective, you wouldn't. Explain things the way you do. You wouldn't understand things the way you do. But you are um, having a point of view based on the perspective or the angle that you are looking at things. And so uh, we want to delve into this this morning. And let me tell you where we're going. And then we will see how we get there. Here's the first point. The old perspective is to see Things from my point of view. The old perspective. And this is the natural pers perspective that we all have. We're seeing things from our point of view. But the new perspective. And this is what we have to look at now. The new perspective is to see something from someone else's point of view. Not just the way I see it. But I need to have a new perspective. I need to see it the way someone else sees it. And here's the final point that we're going to make. The true perspective is to see something from all points of view. The true perspective or what to see something the way it really is requires you not just one point of view, but a 360 degree Looking at this, seeing it from all aspects, seeing it from all angles, and then you will have a true perspective. Now, really, the only one that has a true perspective on everything is God. Because he's everywhere present. He knows the end from the beginning. He sees things from all aspects. He knows our hearts. He knows our mind. So, the true perspective... The only true perspective is the one that God has. And he sees the relationship between the size of things and how far they are from each other and how they relate to everything. 
God has that eternal perspective. Now, here's our next point that we need to realize. Our perspective is limited. It's very limited. I only see what I see. I don't see anything out here. I don't see anything behind me. And if I do, then I don't see here. Whatever perspective you're looking at something from is limited. Now, the way I illustrate this many times when I'm doing the marriage counseling uh, and the premarital counseling is to illustrate that couples will see things differently. And I illustrate it this way. If I say to one person, what do you see? And they would describe a hand that the thumb would be on their right and the fingers would move towards you. And uh, you would say, that's, that's what it is. That's what I see. But if I say to the other person, but I give them another perspective, and I say, what do you see? And they'd say, well, the thumb is on my left and the fingers move away from me. And oh yeah, there's nails. And so if these people begin to compare their perspective, the one person would say, you know, the thumb's on the right hand side. Say, no, it's on the left. Say, well, the fingers move away. No, they move towards you. And one would say, you know, there's nails. And the other person says, there are no nails. I looked at it. I saw it. There were no nails. Now, what couples need to see and all of us need to see is that we have a limited perspective. And we're not seeing the whole thing. We're only seeing part of it. And we can draw conclusions on what we see, but many times those conclusions will be wrong because we only have a limited perspective. And so the next point is this. To understand the truth or the way things really are, you need all perspectives. If those two people got together that saw the hand, and, you know, they didn't know anything about a hand. This is just something they're seeing new. If they talked long enough and heard one another, they might come up with the conclusion, you know, it's a hand, but we're seeing it from different angles. And from my angles, the finger, from my angle, the finger moves away. And from the other, your angle, so, so we must be seeing two sides of this. It's the same thing, two sides. One side has nails and the other doesn't have nails. Now, they would come to a much better idea of reality if they could hear one another's perspectives and then they would come to a truer perspective. But it's amazing how we get locked in to our own perspective the way we th see things. And then, not only that, but we begin to argue and debate the other person and saying they're wrong because they don't have the same perspective that we do. So what we have to do is, be, is to realize, you know, I see this and this is what makes me sort of think I'm right. But you need to be mature enough and wise enough to realize, even though I think I'm right, I'm only seeing this in part, so I have to be wise enough to know I may be wrong in my conclusion. Even though from what I see alone, I would say that's right, but I have to take other perspectives into account if I want to see the true reality. Now, here, here's our next point, and th this is really important. God designed the natural body, this natural body that we have, and the spiritual body that God has, which is the church. He's designed both the natural body and the church with different perspectives. That the members of the body have a different perspective, whether it be the natural body or the spiritual body. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now indeed there are many members but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, 
I have no need of you. God designed the body in such a way, just this physical body that we have, that the eyes have a perspective and they see something. But the ears have another aspect. They hear. And our nose detects something completely different. It smells. And our tongue tastes. And our fingers feel. All different members seeing something, evaluating something from a different point of view. And they each could vary one with the other. But the scriptures has here, if, if you only look at the eye and you only hear what the eye is saying, well, where's the hearing? You're not even going to know that there's something unless you hear the ear. And the hand has to recognize that the, uh, there's other aspects other than feeling and touching. And so it's God designed the body this way. And it's all to work together. And the head of the body hears all these aspects and then assigns to each one what they should do and takes and collects the data. The brain does this. And so here's the point I wrote in your notes. And this is what Paul is saying because he's referring not just to a natural body, he's referring to the church that each member has a special perspective that the entire body needs. That the body needs the perspective of each member. And if one of those members is lacking or is not heard, then the whole body is going to be deficient because it doesn't have all the perspectives that it needs to function. Now, we understand that in the physical body. But do we understand it in the spiritual body? Because we all see things differently. We have different perspectives. We have different giftings. And we evaluate things differently. And we, if we're not careful, the danger, here's the next point, the danger is that we consider our perspective as the whole perspective. And we act as if we don't need anyone else. And if anyone contradicts what, I'm thinking or what I'm feeling, then I will argue with them, I'll debate with them, I will uh, say they're wrong, and I might even talk about them after, about how crazy they are to even view things the way they do. Listen to what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 11 and 12. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, or I became mature, I put away childish things. For now we see through a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Do you know that you only know in part? The writer here says, now I know in part, but then I... Sh I shall know just as I am also known. We all are limited in our perspective. And we only know in part. And you will interpret things from your, inter uh, from your perspective. And, and how you're made and how you're constituted. Um, you know, you may have heard the expression, if you're a hammer, you see everything as a nail. Because your function is to hammer things. And so you'll look at something and you'll hammer in a screw. You might hammer in a, a, a peg of some sort that's meant to have something. But when you're a hammer, you're seeing everything. How can I wham this thing? And, and every tool in your toolbox is like that. It has a, it has a function. And it only sees that function, and everything it sees will be from that perspective. And so we got to be careful that we are not seeing something from a singular perspective. Now, one of these ways we can illustrate this very quickly is in Romans chapter 12, where it lists the motivational gifts. And the first gift it uh, registers is the gift of prophecy. The last of the seven is the gift of mercy. 
Now, it's not my intent to even get into this, but I just want to draw a contrast here. Because the one with the gift of prophecy speaks as God, speaks God's truth, has a love for God's truth and righteousness and will declare it. But the one that has the gift of mercy is more focused on the individual, more sympathetic, will come alongside and comfort. That's the gift of mercy. So there could be two people, one with the gift of prophecy and one with the gift of mercy. And they see someone do something wrong. Well, the one with the gift of prophecy will, will quickly speak out and say, that's wrong. You should never have done that. You need to smarten up. You need to be more careful. You need to do better. What are they doing? They're declaring God's truth. What they're saying is right. But that alone could destroy an individual who's struggling to do something. Well, the one with the gift of mercy comes along and they just take the other side. And they go, oh, I feel so sorry. It's too bad. Don't worry about it. Everybody makes mistakes. And, and you'll get over that and you'll do better next time. Well, which one's right? They're both right. And they're meant to be held in tension with one another. We need to know God's truth. We need to know what God sees. We need to know righteousness. But we also need to know God's grace and how he bestows it to us. And he gives us a second chance. Both are right. Not one or the other. They're both right. And, but they're each a different perspective of how God works in our lives. And, and members of the church have different giftings. And so again, we need to realize my perspective is not the whole thing. And I need to grow up. In this portion, Paul said, when I was a child, I did this. When you're immature, you might act a certain way and say things and have a, different, a certain perspective. But when you grow up and when you mature, you're to put away childish things and realize, you know what? I think I'm right, but you know, I may not be right. I have to be wise enough, mature enough again that I realize that I can be wrong and I need to be open to hear another perspective. Romans 12, 16 just sort of summarizes it this way. Do not be wise in your own opinion. We all have an opinion. I tell you, we all think our opinions are right. We'd change them if we thought they were wrong. But we need to realize, ah, my opinion is not always right, even though I think it's right. So don't be wise. Don't be so sure. Don't be so cocky in your own opinion. Now that takes us to the next point. An attitude of humility is required to see a new perspective. If you're going to see something different than what you've always seen, then it takes an attitude of humility. As I've already said, you have to mature, you have to grow up. You have to humble yourself and say, you know what, I may not see it all, I may not know it all, and so I'm going to be open. That's what humility does. Here, listen to these verses in Romans 12 and verse 16. Live together in peace with each other. Don't be proud, but we be willing to... But be willing to be friends with people who are not important to others. You know, there's some people that just sort of get disregarded. For whatever reason, we think they are less. In fact, Paul goes back to this analogy in Romans 12 about the body. He says there's some members of the body that uh, are more private. And we don't show them. But he said it doesn't mean they're, they're not more important or less important. And so the same thing here. He's saying... Be friends with people who are not important to others. Don't think of yourself as smarter than anyone else. Now this is just simply humility. Now it goes on in Philippians 2 verses 3 to 7. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, 
did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. I tell you, when you contemplate these verses, they are powerful. It said, we need to have the same thinking that Jesus had. Who, he was in the form of God. He was God. But he made himself of no reputation. He came and took on flesh. And he walked among us. And he related to people in this world. Think about it. Jesus knows everything. And yet he carries on conversations with people who know very little. But he enters into the conversation. He's not a know-it-all. He asks questions. He tries and he does lead people along to truth. But he's not overpowering. He said we need to have the same mind. We, not to, we shouldn't think of ourselves, even though we think, oh, I know it all. You need to be more careful and be like Christ. And realize, hey, this person, I think, oh, they're, they're, they're insignificant. They, they don't have anything they could teach me. You need to stop and say, wait a minute. I want to be like Christ. I'm not going to take on the, the air of superiority. But I'm going to come and I'm going to relate. And I'm going to walk. And I'm going to humble myself. And I'm going to be with people and realize I can learn from anyone. So here's the next point, and, it, and it's really a key point. The key to seeing other perspectives is the ability to listen. If you're going to see some other perspective, you have to be able to listen. Um, because that's, that's, only how, that's the only way you're going to see what other people see. You, you, you can't even get where they are and say, okay, I'm looking at... No, you have to hear what they see because they have... Like the ears have a certain ability to detect things the eyes can't. And the nose can detect things that the eyes and the ears can't. So there are members in the body that detect things that, that you'll never see unless you open your ears to hear what they're saying. And so if you're going to see someone else's perspective, you have to humble yourself and you have to listen. Now listen to what Proverbs 12, 15 says. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. They'll hear counsel. They'll hear another perspective. But a fool, he's just right in his own eyes. He's locked in. He's immature. Listen. You can only learn when you are listening. You will never learn while you're talking. You will learn while you're listening. And listening to someone who has a different opinion or point of view or perspective than you have. That's the only way you're going to learn. If you won't listen to someone else, you'll just stay in your own state of ignorance. Because you'll never learn. You have to open your heart, open your mind, and open your ears and listen. Now listen to what James 1.19 says. My dear brothers and sisters, always be more willing to listen than to speak. Keep control of your anger. So, you know, our anger comes up when we believe we're right and we feel like the other person isn't understanding what we're trying to say and we get into an argument. So he says, listen, don't do that. He says, be more willing to listen than you are to speak. Hold your emotions in check. Goes on in Proverbs 17, 27. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. Certainly you're going to increase in knowledge. If you stop speaking and start listening... You're going to increase in knowledge. And then Proverbs 18 too. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. I think it's time for us to evaluate ourselves. Have, we, have you ever inspected yourself to say, how quick am I to speak and how quick am I to listen? Now we can detect this in other people quite readily. They're not listening. They're not listening. They should be listening. I'm talking. They should be listening. But we need to turn it around and say, 
how much am I listening? And if I'm going to increase in knowledge, if I'm going to be mature, if I'm going to be a wise person, I'm not going to be a fool, then I have to open my ears and listen. And stop expressing my opinion and start listening to others. So, that is such a key. Now, here's the second key. And, and, and folks, this even gets deeper and more probing into our lives. The key to having our perspective heard, when we want to share our perspective, we want people to hear it, the key to having our perspective heard is to listen first and speak second. If there's going to be an interchange of perspectives, and now obviously that's what needs to be. Everyone needs to hear the other person's perspective. But we all want to speak first. Because we're so sure of our perspective that we, we want to speak first. But the key to having your perspective heard and received is to listen first, speak second. Listen to Proverbs 18.13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is a folly and a shame. Don't give an answer. Don't give your opinion until you've heard. If not, the scripture says it's a folly and it's a shame if you do that. Uh, Stephen Covey wrote about this in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the habits he said that they have and it's the same truth, but he's just couching it in his own words. And it was this. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. Now we all need to understand and we all need to be understood. But you need to seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. Here's what we need to see. Human nature, our natural tendency is... To feel that we're heard before we'll open our ears to hear something else. That's just the way most people are wired. They want to speak first before they'll listen to anyone else. People are hungry to tell their own story. They have their point of view. They have their experiences. And it's been very real to them. It's been emotional in their life. And they want to tell their story. And if you listen to their story, then they'll feel understood, valued, and important. That has to happen before they open their ears to hear something else. Now, most of us don't realize this, um, that people need to be heard first before they'll be open to hear. And so, if we want to see another opinion and want our opinion to be heard, the first thing you should do is seek to hear the other person's opinion. Now, this will go against the grain. You'll want to speak yours first. But here's where maturity comes in. You have to be wise enough to buck this human trend within you that I need to speak and, and to be wise enough to realize, you know what, I'm really only be heard, going to be heard if I allow this person to know that I've heard what they've said, I've understood what they've said, and I can say it back to them. It's at that point that they're going to open up to hear what you have to share. And it takes a mature person to understand this, buck the natural trend of uh, wanting to speak first, but a mature person will act in this manner because they will then hear the other perspective and their perspective will be heard. So here's the next point. The most mature person should take the lead in listening. If there's two immature people, it's just going to be a battle back and forth. They're going to be talking over each other. They're breaking in. They're interrupting. Um, it takes a mature person to close their mouth and open their ears. And, but this is the key to seeing another perspective. And for having your perspective heard. 
Listen to what it says in Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. And so we can get into this state of um, just want to rush into things, but this is saying, if, you, if, if, if there's a conflict here, and I'm just using this, he says, you that are spiritual, you need to prepare yourself and you need to go in a, in a, with a gentleness because then you can restore. Otherwise, you're just going to mess this thing. You're just going to roil up the waters until uh, it's all muddied and nothing gets accomplished. You that are spiritual. In other words, the most mature person has to take the lead in listening. You see, the problem is not in people wanting to share their opinion. You know, we're not seeing other people's perspective, not because there's not voices out there. It's because our ears are closed and we won't hear. And people are not hearing your perspective because their ears are closed. We need to see that we need to curb our propensity to speak. And cultivate our desire to listen. Because if we do this, then there's going to be the interchange of ideas. Now, that takes us to a very practical part as we close this message. We need to practice intentional listening. I mean, how do we really do this in a practical way? Uh, I tell you. We can understand from a spiritual point of view all of what I've just spoken and yet still have a problem until you begin to realize I need to intentionally listen. I can't just think listening is, is no effort. I don't have to put any attention to this. No, if you're going to listen, you have to, you have to give attention to it. You have to learn how to listen. Now, I just jotted down four things as I was meditating on this. And uh, just, just follow along. Have an open heart to hear what I'm saying right now. Anytime you're in a discussion with someone else and you're having an interchange of views, and it's necessary that we do so because we need to see things from other people's perspective. Here's the first thing. You need to be present. Not just physically <laughs> But present in mind, present in your attention, have your spirit engaged. You need to remove all the other distractions around you and give full attention to the other person. We don't always do this. We might say, I'm listening, but we're doing something else. And we're not looking the person in the eye. You need to be present. Here's the second thing. You need to be open. You need to have an open heart to receive. So you've just got to make a decision. I, I, I'm not going to be wise in my own opinion. I, I want to truly hear. I value the input of this person. Even though they're going to see it differently than I do. But I value their input because I see they have a different perspective. I want to know what that is. I, I'm really curious to know what they're seeing. What I'm missing. And if you will be open. Then there will be this interchange. But you have to have an open heart. An open attitude to receive from someone else. Now here's the third thing. You need to be engaged. Engaged. You need to actively listen. In the sense of ask clarifying questions to the content. Not to ask questions that contradict what they're saying. But ask questions that clarifies to make sure I am hearing what they are saying. Um, you need to work at this. So when, after someone has spoken, don't quickly respond, but speak back what you've heard. You say something along the line of, okay, let, let me see if I understand what you're saying. I think you were saying, and then you say it. And I'll tell you, most of the time, people will cry, say, no, 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 that's not, that's not what I meant. But, and then rather than say, well, I know what you meant. No, no, <laughs> you got up an open heart and just say, okay, listen. All right, let me hear it again. And listen enough and ask enough questions 
till you can say their position back to them better than what they can say it. And, and when you say, is this what you said? And then they go, exactly. <laughs> you need to do it till, they may not say the word exactly, but that's what they're saying. Exactly, that, that's it. I, I, I'm, you got it. It's only at that point that they will begin to open up to listen to what you're saying. Now, here's the last one. Be reflective. Be reflective. Think about it. It's going to be different than what you think. They're going to say there's nails. You're going to say, but there are no nails. And so you got to reflect on this and think about it and say, now how can these two conf seemingly conflicting views come together? Many times they're just held in tension against one another, as we mentioned about the one with the gift of mercy and the one that has the gift of prophetic word to speak God's truth. They're just held in tension against each other. And don't disparage one or the other. But hear what the other person is saying and treasure it. Be reflective. Uh, don't correct them. Don't debate them. Just say, okay, I need to, I need to assess and assimilate and say, God, what are you saying to me through this other person? If you do that, then the eye will hear what the ear is saying. And, uh, and so forth. The members of the body will begin to be able to share. And the body will be edified. The final point, And it's sort of a balancing point to all this. You need to discern Satan's lies. Discern Satan's lies. Because... It's not that everything that's said is, has value. And we find the story when Peter, well meaningly, says to Jesus, you know, uh, you're not going to go to the cross. Don't, 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 talk this, don't talk this way about you dying. And Jesus rebukes him in Matthew 16, 23 and says, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me for you're not mindful of the things of God but the things of men. And I just need to bring this qualifying aspect. It's not that every opinion you hear in the world, everything that you hear out there is valid and you have to just somehow assimilate that into your worldview. That's not, it's not true. There's a lot that's being said in the world that are the lies of Satan and you need to discern his lies. Now, saying that though, we have to be careful. Where when we're in the body of Christ and a brother or sister in the Lord and they have a different view than you have that we come back and we begin to hear what they're saying. What, what they're saying. Then go to the word of God which is the truth and begin together to discern what God's word says about this matter. And if we'll do that and have the word of God be our umpire as it were and uh, clarifying truth and praying together and seeking God together, then we will have, could have opposite opinions that are both from the Lord and he wants us to come together. And we, he wants us to be able to see true reality. Well, this message um, is important. God's doing a new thing. And many times we don't see what God is doing because we're not hearing what he's doing from someone else. We're only viewing it from our own opinion. It's so important that we open our heart, open our ears, and close our mouths and listen to what God wants to say to us through someone else. Let's pray together. Father, we, we've spoken your word this morning and, and it, do, it is convicting because we realize how often we speak before we even try to listen and we only listen to bring a rebuttal or to bring the other point of view and we're truly not hearing one another. I ask, O oh Lord, today that we would have a new perspective, that we would glean from someone else that sees something differently than we do. And that prayerfully together we can come before you and help and that you would then clarify all these issues 
that we can see things the way they really are. I pray it for myself, for my family, for this church, for everyone that hears me today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Wow, that was a powerful message. New perspective. God, help us to really see this, to really apply this into our own life, to be open, to be present, to be humble, to receive what you have for us this morning. I pray for you. I pray for your family. This difficult time that we're going through, I pray that you would experience peace like never before, that God would speak to you, that you would feel his presence like never before. Make sure to connect with us. Make sure to engage with us on our social media. Join our mailing list. Uh, we're going to be sending out emails and updates and stuff that we have coming up. Uh, please just be engaged with us. Don't, don't be a loner. We need each other. We need to listen to each other. We need to connect more with each other. So I just want to challenge you with that this morning to um, be open, be receptive. And I pray that your week ahead would be better than the last week. Uh, join us in our 4A chat right now. If you're here, if you have a few minutes, just click the link below. Join us. We would love to see you live and pray with you. And uh, hope to see you again very soon. God bless you, your family, and all that you do. Bye for now.